Are we live? When did we go live? Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Faith of Victory Church, and we're glad to have you tonight, and so good to see you tonight. It's um, All Hallowed Eve, hallelujah, and um, we're, we're, we love Jesus, and uh, we don't have any devils here, hallelujah. Um, we are having a harvest festival for the kids, and they're, they're, uh, they're getting to get some candy and stuff, but they couldn't come like, you know, demons and um, witches or vampires, and uh, there's a reason for that. We don't believe in those things. But we do celebrate Jesus. And, you know, they could come like Moses. They could come like Jesus. Uh, if they figured out a way to walk on water while they were doing it, it would be great. Um, hallelujah. But I'm not sure that they did. But anyway, so I'm going to share this share that we're live, everybody, and uh, tell them that, you know, we're here. And um, come on, share, like post, and turn it down. And turn it down while we're doing it. We've got about a 15-second delay. Some kind of delay. All right. Oh, okay. By the time it gets to Facebook. Okay. All right. Well, praise the Lord. <coughs> so it's out there. Glory to God. Well, it's a welcome. We're glad to have you. And um, I'm excited because, you know, last year, um, at this time, I had just gotten out of the hospital on that Thursday. Uh, so a year ago tomorrow, I got out of the hospital and then... You know, we canceled the this Sunday Downey's barbecue because it just couldn't be done. Like I said, Sunday I was going to do it. But. Both the boss spoke. <laughs> See, in my life, the Holy Ghost is five foot two inches. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Her clone's five two and a half. Yeah, about half inch taller. Yeah. Well, you know, there are the seven spirits of God. That's what the <laughs> Two of them are five, two, and five, two, and a half. Anyway. All right, we... That's right. That's right. <coughs> all right. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Glory. <coughs> Hallelujah. All right. Well, we started last week on, on prayer. In uh, Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayer in, uh, in supplication in the Spirit, watching to, all, there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So I'm praying always with all prayer. As we said last week in Ephesians 6, 18, um, Paul says all prayer. Uh, other translations say um, all kinds of and we talked about how that you know not all prayers prayed the same way. Um, you know, we we did talk about the, the different types of prayer. Talked about you know one the prayer of thanksgiving. Two the prayer of worship, adoration. You can call that you know. Prayer of supplication. Four. Intercession. Uh, binding and loosing. Consecration and dedication. And then seven, prayer of believing. or as we would commonly call it, the prayer of faith. I like to call this prayer the, the prayer of consecration. It, it, it be thy will. Also call that the if it be thy will prayer. Okay. 
Because this is the only place we pray that. It's here. When we're consecrating and dedicating to the will of God. All these other prayers, we would have a basis for faith to pray them out. Thanksgiving and worship, I mean, the, these prayers are heart prayers. Now, don't take me wrong. All prayers are supposed to be heart Get what I'm trying to say. These are the heart of man in his relationship with God. Okay? Heart relationship prayers. And you always, you always got somebody there looking for you to make up, say something. Take a, ah, rah, 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 rah. Just, just go rah, 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 somewhere else. Okay? But this, this is the heart of me. This is where you're, you're thankful to God for all that he's done, for all that he, he gives when you, you pray. You know, uh, with all prayer, supplication, and with thanksgiving, let your request be made unto God. Thanksgiving is, is coming. That's, the, that's, that's the part of that heart relationship. Worship and adoration. This is the heart relationship prayers. Okay? This is where we're in communion with God. Um, not trying to get something, but thankful for who he is, worshiping for who he is, thankful for the things he's done. Okay? So, so this is where these kind of come in. Supplication, intercession, th these, are, these, are, um, these are petition prayers. Um, and supplication actually means to petition. Okay? Um, this one on behalf of others. This one on, you know, more like on the behind scenes. This is an authority prayer. Okay. This, again, uh, honestly, this would probably kind of get into this category of the heart because you're, you're wanting to be in the will of God. You're wanting to honor God. You're wanting to please God. And so you're consecrating and dedicating. You're, you're setting aside your desires and your wants to fulfill His. his. Even though your heart or your own will and your own desire may be something different, you're, you're setting, if it be your will, not my will, your will be done. You're setting aside your will, your desires, your purposes for him. So this goes back to your heart. This gets to that heart relationship. So these three prayers are really going to kind of cover that. And then this is uh, the things we do to function. This, really a fun, this is a, a lifestyle of faith prayer is believing and receiving. How do I receive from God the things that I need to be effective in, as a, in life as a Christian, as a person, you know, to receive the blessings of God, to walk in the blessings of God, to do the will of God uh, with the equipping and the, and the things that God's given me. And so we get into the, the believing, receiving, what we, we often refer to as the prayer of faith. Okay? Now, we have said that all prayer is prayed in what? It's what, Penny? It's prayed in faith. Okay, so that's why I like to kind of put this in here because, you know, we, if we say we got to pray in faith and then we start, we start mixing up. Now, how many can look at this list and kind of go, you, know, you know, there's probably different rules that govern these different prayers. Hmm? Would, would you think there's a different rule that for believing and receiving versus intercession? How about binding and loosing? Consecration and dedication. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other animal. I mean, honestly. Consecration, dedication. When did that show up? Thank you, Jesus. It's appeared out of nowhere. It, what is it? It's... It's manna. Oh, yeah, what is it? All right. So, so we have these different types of prayer, and you know, we we typically when we start talking about prayer, um, we because because there are so many needs in the body of Christ, and people have so many needs in their own personal life, and etc. That we oftentimes and usually do, and I I do, and I probably will, you know, really kind of begin with the emphasis on the prayer, believing, and receiving the prayer of faith, just because there's so much need. Okay, but we you know we're. These ought you to have done and not leave the others undone. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> going to my classical Pentecostal, we did a lot of this. That's what we, we had to go down to the altar every Wednesday night and every Sunday night. And the old saints would come down and they'd grab a hold of you. And they'd get the 
claw on you. I mean, they, they get a hold of you. Joe, you ever, you ever been in one, in one of them? Oh, yeah, they get, they get you. Oh, no, they would, they would get a hold of They'd get you. they get the young people. They'd get them a hold of them. It was like the Vulcan pinch. I mean, they had you, baby. And they, they'd call heaven down. And they'd pray all kinds of stuff over you. You're supposed to be down there getting your heart to write with God. You won't get out of there without having heard something for about 20 minutes. Okay? Well, uh, I could still hear the voice of Brother Paramore, you know, praying, you know, about God using us and God calling us and God uh, blessing our lives and so forth. Um, so this was every Sunday and Wednesday night in the, in the church. Come on down, let's pray, you know. And, and I, I remember something Brother Hagin said years ago. He said um, a lot of the counseling we, would do, we do today would be done away with if we spend more time at the altar praying. He had, a, had somebody come to him one time and say, I need, I need some counseling. He said, fine. He said, but what I want you to do is I want you to come for the next six weeks on Sunday night or whatever, I mean Wednesday night or whatever, and you come to the altar and pray, and then after six weeks I'll pray with you. I'll, I'll counsel you. At the end of six weeks, the person came to him and said, I don't need anything. He said, why not? He said, I got my answer in the altar. See, it's getting, getting along with God, getting down there and getting into prayer and seeking the face of God. He got answers. Amen. Praise God. We we get a, we get a lot of answers here. In this prayer, this prayer, this consecration and dedication. That's not to take the place of, you know, needing to believe God for healing or you know finances in your household. This this doesn't take care of this. Nor does the prayer of believing and receiving take care of the consecration and dedication. They're different rules. Now I watched the horrible World Series. I, did, I wasn't pulling for Boston. wasn't really all that great excited about Los Angeles, but I really wasn't pulling for Boston. Um, just I won the A's, but they got knocked out in the first game of the you know the wild card playoff, and um, so I, I was just kind of mad with all of them. <clears throat> okay, um, but and, and then you know so I'd be, I'd be going back between baseball and football on Monday night because neither game was worth watching. Click, 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 click. You know. But there was two completely set different rules that covered them. They were both sports. They were both sports channels. They were being covered by sports networks. They had the information about it showed up in the sports page the next day. But they were two different types of sports and different rules that governed them. You can't play them by the same rules. And so we have prayer. We have all these different types of prayer. And as I kind of pointed out, we have heart relationship prayers. We have petition prayers. We have authority prayers. We have, uh, you know, faith, a prayer of faith, which we, you know, prayer that are governed by different rules, okay? A lot of this and this is going to be your heart cry with God. It's going to be you coming along with God and just, you know, pouring your heart out to Him in thanksgiving and adoration and how wonderful He is. Now, these are not... I don't know if that's spelled correctly. But these are not whiny prayers. <clears throat> when, I read the, when I read David's psalms of thanksgiving, when I read David's psalms of adoration, you know, and praise and worship, I don't hear whiny. Okay? Oh, God, yeah. Blame, despair, agony on me. Deep, dark, depression, excessive misery. You've been worried for bad luck. I have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Some of you are old enough to remember Hee Haw. How many remember Hee Haw? How many remember the Gloom Despair song? You know, came right after Where, Where Are You Tonight? You know, why did you leave me here all alone? Searched the world over, you thought you found true love, you met another, and pfft, you was gone, all right? Where, oh, where? Okay, anyway. But what, when we, when we get into these kind of worship Prayers. What do we begin? To, what do we begin to see when we look in the Psalms? The greatness of our God. This is where we forget about all the stuff going on around us. 
We're not trying to get anything out of him. We're not trying to get an answer to a, to a need. Hello? We're not trying to get a need met. You know? And, and, and sad to say, far too often, the, about the, the only prayer that people come to God with is in here. We have a need, we show up. You're going to be more effective here if you've been effective here. When you have been spending time meditating and extolling and declaring the greatness, the wonderfulness, the majesty of God. How great. I mean, you think of the old hymns. How great thou art. I mean, in that song, you kind of forget about you. You, 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 you become the back burner. And the greatness of God just becomes the forefront. How great thou art. Amen? You know, I hear the sound of rolling thunder. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the lyrics. I kind of went blank right now because I, I, I want to sing it. I have to sing it to remember the lyrics. And I don't sing well. All right? How great thou art. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds the hands have made. It's just extolling God. Oh, how great you are! How majest your majesty, your glory, you're wonderful. We just get caught up with God is awesome. And we're stepping back. We're taking a breath. And we're looking <coughs> at the works of the hand of the Creator. And we just stand in awe. We even have people write songs. <coughs> oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. When I'm thinking of the greatness of God, I just don't have the words. Thank you, God. If I just had a thousand tongues to sing of your greatness and your glory and your wonder. See, these, these build in our consciousness. Look at what David writes. See the things he wrote. Now, you know, some of this stuff's prophetical. The 22nd like Psalm is prophetical. It's prophetic of, of Jesus at the cross. Okay? We understand that. But when, he's, when his psalms of adoration, his psalms of the greatness of God, you don't come away whining. You don't come out going, just call me Eeyore. Life is tough all over. No. Mm -mm. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Where have they said among the heathen, um, what was that? Their God has done great things. Whereof He has done great things. Then He just goes on talks about how great things He's done. That's just how it's they would just, he'd have a victory. He had to go write about how great God was. It wasn't faith man here. <laughs> Look at me. Man, I pulled some stuff off today, baby. I heard a preacher say one time, and I, and I, I love his ministry, but this is one statement I have just I hated he ever made it. Wish he had never made it. Wasn't that Hagen. But he said, the lifestyle of faith works. I'm going to tell you, even if, even if Jesus wasn't real, God wasn't real, the Bible wasn't real, I'd still live this way because faith works. Now, I could almost kind of possibly semi-think I could, might be able to kind of read into what he was trying to say. I hate the statement. Because this is why it works. The greatness of God. 
This is why I can have faith. Because I see the majesty and the glory of all the works of his hands. When I consider, um, when I consider the things God has done. Amen. I'm just going to try to maybe just jump in here and see what. Um, Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I have acknowledged my, <coughs> I have acknowledged my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was sharpened and shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in my inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me no wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Um, this is after he had gone into Bathsheba. He had sinned big time. How could, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from the blood guiltness, O God, and the God of my salvation, my tongue. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth praise. Thou, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou desirest not burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And, o God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole offerings. Even in sin, he was coming to God knowing he would cleanse, he would restore. Amen? He would set him back. Amen? He would put him back into place where he needed to be. Hallelujah. Psalm 24. Now, remember, Psalm 22 is the cross. Psalm 23 is the resurrection. And then, then we get to Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Who hath clean hands and a pure heart and hath not lifted up his soul into vanity and sworn deceitfully? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him that seek that thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is following the resurrection. It's the King of glory. We have to get to where the heart is thankful. The heart is full of worship. The heart is full of adoration. And we're consecrating and dedicating to whatever his will is for, for our life. Now that is, you don't pray number six over cancer. That's, that's just not, that's nonsensical. It's not biblical. You don't say, oh God, use this cancer for whatever purpose... So you're being silly. You're being misinformed. Consecrating and dedicating is saying, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll make whatever sacrifice is necessary to do the will of God for reaching the earth and fulfilling your purpose for my life. If it means I have to move, if it means I have to, you know, make a change, if it means this takes place, I'll do what you tell me to do. I heard Brett Dad Hagen, he would talk about this prayer of consecration and dedication. And uh, one time, he spent six months over one winter because God began to deal with him about leaving the church and going back on the field ministry. Now, he'd been in field ministry, taking a church, and he was, it was the best it ever been. <clears throat> they had the best money. They had the nicest parsonage. They were, I mean, his, him and his family were living the best they'd ever lived. And he knew what it was like on the field. 
and he didn't want to go back on the field. It's, he just, it was comfortable. He could preach, he could teach, he could minister, he could be with his family. He, he didn't want to go back in the field ministry. It was hard. And you've got to understand, back in them days, I mean, people would steal your offerings. The board would get together and say, that's too much money. Now, let's just give him such and such, and we'll keep the rest and put it into the church. Because they just didn't think it was right for a preacher to get that much money if it was a good offering. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he was preaching one time, and somebody, one of the deacons came in late and sat down. And right in the middle of his sermon, he ran off, ran down the cell, on the, on, right beside the guy in the church, and went, did you know somebody's trying to steal my money? Got back and ran back up on the pulpit and finished the sermon said that man every bit of color went out of his face because he had just come from a meeting with other board members where they were trying to steal the money that the offerings were coming in too big and he was he was a ringleader saying he didn't he didn't deserve that much money they just need to put it in the general fund and give him x number of dollars and tell him that's how much came in whole ghost told off on him you know and all the other men that was involved that meeting had to know now i'll be honest with you i had i had situation happen a number of years ago i was preaching and we had some stuff was going on in the church. There was, a church. there was a church split rising up. And people were coming to me talking about, you know, pastor this and pastor that, and then get together at the back of the church service and talking about me and planning stuff and everything. <clears throat> and I walked right out to one of the guys one night. It was right in the middle of all this stuff. I was preaching. And I don't know why I did. I was, I, you know, I don't ever sit on the, podium, on, the, on the stage. I never sat up on the platform. And I walked down, put my hand on this guy's shoulder. I looked at him and said, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, isn't it? He's an African-American fella, but he turns white as me. I mean, every bit of the color went out of his face. And then I would say stuff that I didn't know what I was saying that they had been saying in secret together. And they would get, now listen, how stupid you can be. They would get together at the back of church after service and say, who told the pastor what we said? Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Yeah. He, he, he couldn't possibly hear and be hearing from God. God told off on him. He was trying to save him. Because what happened was, in the end, people backslid. One, one, uh, one um, man died. He had come out, he had come out of drugs and all this kind of stuff, went back. Ended up, you know, dying. Lost his marriage. Other people lost their marriages. Other people got caught um, in all kinds of mess. Just messed up. They just messed up people. And I, I can't, I mean, I still get angry. Because there were people there that their lives were forever set in a, in a disarrayed dis course where they never recovered from that could have had a wonderful walk with God, but they got messed up and got caught up in this stuff. And they, they, just didn't, they didn't recover. They just didn't recover. They ended up splitting the church. They, can, you know, they almost put us under. Really did. And tried. I mean, they tried. They wanted to. They wanted, to. they wanted their vengeance. They wanted their pound of flesh. They wanted to prove they were right by making us go under. If we went under, then it proved they were right. But I wasn't the one caught in adultery at 2 o'clock in the morning with the, the worship leader. Two years later. Hello. Yeah. The pastor was sent. He was the pastor of Jeremiah. Sent to restore all those that pastor had scattered around Greensboro. Yeah, he was doing some couch time with him too. Mm-hmm. You don't rejoice in it. Hello. But God speaks. He said, God speaks. Amen. How did I get over there? Somebody out there needed it. I don't know who you are, but you needed it. Yep, praise the Lord. All right, so back to the consecration and dedication part here. Um, yeah, but Brother Hank spent the whole winter, and finally he said, all right, Lord, um, I'll, I'll go back on the road. He didn't want to. I mean, how do, how do you leave the comfort? And go, oh, we got talking about people robbing the money and all that stuff, and you know, and people saying they didn't, you know, not believe God's talking to people. 
God talks. I mean, I, I heard the story that I can tell one time about this guy who was backslid in the church, way backslid. I mean, so backslid that, you know, he ended up dying cursing God. But he came into the church service and been in and out, you know, and uh, he was on the platform watching saw watch God come in. The church was quiet as a mouse because the Holy Spirit had come. And we think, us charismatic, word of faith people, think that whenever the Holy Spirit's a manifestation, it's got to be wild, crazy. I'm telling you, there's some of the most powerful services when you're just sitting there in the, in, in the presence of God and nothing's happening. You know, no physical things are happening because you're sitting in the presence of God. Now, growing up classical Pentecostal, we, if it was a wild move of God, it better be God because if it wasn't, grandma's going to hurt your temple. Bam! God's moving. You don't act like that in church. You didn't, you didn't do anything that would be disruptive to the move of the Spirit. If, it's, if, it's, if it was a move of the Spirit where people were running and shouting, it better be God because if not, you're going to get it because we don't, we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And you're like, wow. It, those things didn't feel good. Yeah. Yeah. We were taught to awe the presence of God. Not act like it was a, a newfound video game or hashtag. We, we, we were stood in awe of the presence of God. I've been, I remember as a kid being in services where God was moving, and even as an unsaved kid, you just felt almost paralyzed because of his presence in the room. You just didn't want to do anything because you felt, you felt unclean to do anything in his presence. Oh, yeah, we're righteous. Just shut up. Talking about having an awe of his presence. When Jesus would appear to people, they'd fall on their feet. When the angels would show up, they'd fall on their, they'd fall on their face. It's dead. Okay? There's something about the presence of God. Why do you think people fall out in the spirit? What do you think happened when they came to arrest Jesus? I am he. Boom! Power of God manifestation. We think it's supposed to fall when you get prayed for. Brother Hagin, we say, he said, you think it's something else when the Holy Spirit knocks them over? How about when he starts standing them back up? <laughs> Hallelujah. Wow. Where did I, where did I go? Where, 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 where? Okay. But he spent that whole winter, and finally he, he, he submitted to the will of God. He said, all right, Lord. And he went, he went to, he said, but you got to tell my wife. Because he didn't want to tell his wife. He did not want to tell her. You can understand. It's been hard. It's been hard. You're trying to send money home to get bills paid. You know, you're believing God with everything you've got. You've got kids who need clothes. You've got this. You've got that. You're using your faith to get everything done. They're on the other end, you know, um, having in, in one sense depend on you to get your, your, have your faith work and get the answers, you know. And, um, you know, and, and uh, and she wrote that book. Uh, was it, the price is not greater than the glory, or the glory is, not, uh, uh, the glory is greater than the price? What did Sister Aretha write, Jesse? It was the only thing she ever wrote. And it was about, it was about the, the cost of ministry, but the end blessings because you obeyed God. Okay? See, Janie and I went through this right here. I had uh, I graduated from Rama. I've been out of Rama for for a while, and um, I wasn't full time at the church in Greenville. Uh, as a matter of fact, they had offered me. They come and told me on one day they were going to hire me, and they came back the following Monday and told me they weren't. Uh, probably the most devastating thing I ever experienced as a minister, as a young, especially a young minister. The pastor came to me on Friday. He said, "You know, he talked to you." How much money do you make? Well, I make da, 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 da. I said, well, um, I'm gonna pray about this one this weekend, but we're planning on hiring you next week. How much notice do you need to give? Well, two weeks. Yeah, I'm ready to roll out the door right then, baby. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> came back Monday. I need to talk to you. When I was standing on the platform Sunday, I heard a voice say, "Why haven't you considered so and so?" So I hired him. 
that day, that afternoon. You're talking about devastated. I mean, I was totally devastated emotionally. I had to leave work. I had to leave. I just had to go home and cry. I just did not know what to do. I couldn't, I couldn't process it. Honestly, I couldn't. I just didn't know what to do with it. I mean, for, you know, for two, three years, all the talk being you're going to be on staff, you're my assistant, you know, although you're not getting paid for it, you're doing the job of the assistant, da 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 Heard a voice and boom. You know, di- didn't take time to pray about it, just, just did it. Not every voice is God. Okay? Just, I've learned that. Because you, you hear something don't mean God's telling you to do something. All right? Um, and I'm not, I don't say that in, in anger or hate or whatever toward that, that pastor. I just, I'm telling you what I was going through. I was going through a, the, the roughest place I'd ever gone through. I mean, so much so that Buddy Buddy Harris came in, he pulled me aside and said, son, you're at the right place doing the right thing with the right man. You just hold tight. He's probably what kept me from, from leaving the ministry, Brother Buddy, because he, he just had... He had the right words at the right time. But Buddy Harrison, Kenneth Hagin's son-in-law, uh, came to our church, and he just, he just, um, we, I knew Brother Buddy. I was ordained with the FCF uh, at the time, and um, you know, just love Brother Buddy. Love Pat. Pat's still alive, but she's still ministering. Uh, just love the Harrisons. And just, but his heart for pastors was just immeasurable. Just, just, just a pastor to pastors. And um, had so much love for him and appreciation. And, um, he, 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 he said, you just hold tight. Okay. No, I don't think, I don't know of anybody else that could have told me that at that point in my life that would have had that effect that he did. And it gave me the, the whatever to, to get back in the game, as it were, and stay steady. Yes, it was a word in season. From somebody I highly respected and um, trusted him. I knew he heard from the Holy Ghost. And, um, but I was devastated. And, um, but then, you know, it was, it was somewhere not long after that, um, the pastor, his brother, who was, who was a missionary for the Pentecostal Holiness Church at the time, he'd been in uh, uh, Haiti and had gone uh, and done some other things. It was getting ready to spearhead a team to Mexico City, Mexico, for the PH Church uh, and plant churches in Mexico City. And, um, and then the assistant pastor, who, who was assistant pastor instead of me, and they invited me to come. So I took off work, and I went. I went to Brother Summerall's missions conference, World Missions Conference. T.L. Osborne and Daisy were the keynote speakers. And you just don't get it. T.L. Osborne, they just didn't think. There was just nothing better. You know, just, just, you know, Brother Osborne was amazing. Wow. Say that backwards. Wow. And he was, he was so sweet. He would say something. He would greet you in English, greet you in Spanish, and greet you in French, and then say, if you can speak English, French, and Spanish, you can communicate with 90% of the world's population. You can communicate with 90% of the world's population. And as a missionary, he thought that was important. So we went out to the conference, and um, we're riding, and we're on the way back. From, it was a great conference. But, I mean, it was just, you're sitting there with, Brother Summerall and Brother Osborne together is close to 100 years of ministry. Missions. People who've been there, done that, knew what they were talking about. I mean, not just, you know, flybys. Not somebody just graduated from Bible school last week has got their, their, their marketed table out there and they're all groomed and all this kind of stuff. You know, and they're teaching on marriage and they've been married six months. And I'm like... It does. It, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, son. Go home, grow a little bit, and then come back and talk to me because you haven't experienced anything. <laughs> I know what the Bible says. Have you put that into practice yet? No, you ain't been married long enough to put it in practice. You, ain't had to deal with, you haven't had to deal with your wife's hormones <laughs> when, when there's no money. And you're, you're faith in it. And you're confessing it and all this. Yeah. You, you couples need to do such as a...
Now, I don't disdain anybody who has, has, that's speaking with the anointing of the Word of God. But, come on. You're going to go do marriage seminars or you've been married six months. It's like the come on, remember, remember men are from Jupiter, uh, men are from uh, women are from Venus, men are from Mars, or whatever that book was. They were not going doing all this speaking, and they were people buying their books and all this, and they got divorced. Yeah, that's that's who I want to listen to. You're gonna help my marriage. <coughs> so anyway, <coughs> we're, we're riding back, and and and, and the. Uh, <laughs> the um, the brother of the pastor who's, who's a missionary starts talking about this this thing they're doing in Mexico City. He looks over and says, "Hey, y'all, to come with us." <coughs> Excuse me. I grew up Pentecostal holiness. He's working with the Pentecostal holiness church. He's a Raymond graduate, but he went out and did this work with the Pentecostal holiness church. And um, he said, "Y'all, to come with us." Help us. Be part, be part of the, 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 the plant team. Love him and his wife. They're great. I mean, really. Honest with great people. Had a heart for God. Heart for missions that you just can't. I mean, they spent, they've retired from the mission field, and then a pastor was in an automobile accident and actually died down in um, Dominican, I think. And they took his church for like eight months to keep it together. Um, but they, you know, they, they, wanted, they didn't want to pastor again. They wanted to travel and do missions work. But they, they just took it for like eight months just to keep it going and keep, and keep it settled while all this was going on. And uh, then they're praying for the right pastor to take over. And they're going to turn it back over. But they're still doing mission work, you know. And he's older than me. And he started talking about me going. And, you know, and I'm, the more he talks about it, the more I'm like, yeah, because I'm young. That's Jesus stuff, man. Come on. <laughs> Come on, start talking to Janie. And she's, you know, she's not, not anywhere near hip on it. Oh, I mean, we're talking lack of hipness is, um, we don't even know the right word for that, hipless or whatever. And um, you know, I'm all, yeah, let's do it. You know, she's thinking, I'm a daddy's girl. We live upstairs in my daddy's house. We live in a two-story a two story Victorian house that's been divided with an upstairs and a downstairs, separate entrances. We live upstairs. Daddy lives downstairs. Mama cooks fried chicken every, uh, about three times a week. Homemade biscuits. We get we get good food all the time. Anyway, um, we start talking about it, and I start saying, you know, let's, you know, and we start talking to the pastor and to, to the to the brother who's missionary, and and um, we start we start moving into the yes direction. And so we got to go to South Carolina. Um, they were having a big thing in, in Lakeland or something, South Carolina, some city in South Carolina. It was it was five thousand people in the meeting. Because it was a missions conference for the PH Church. And it was a big thing in, in, Florida, in South Carolina there. And so we go, we, I get up and talk about how we're going on this team. <laughs> we're taking Jesus, you know. And then I'm going to be meeting with the um, head of the PH Mission Board after the, after the meeting. Well, we found out that we got to go to London, England for 10 weeks to mission school. She doesn't like water. So flying over water was really. We're talking, we went from hipless to hipless on steroids. <laughs> we're, I mean, we're, we're serious. I mean, we're serious. This is serious. I mean, she says, I'll go, but I ain't going to London. So I go to, I go to, to the pastor's brother and say, look, Jane's willing to go, but she, she don't want to have to go to London. And so he tries to talk to uh, I forgot the guy's name. Maybe Uriel, but I don't think that's it. I think it was something else. Um, um, and uh, he says, they, they, they'll go, but they don't have to go to London school. He said, you got, it. you got to go to the school to go. And, you know, to go. So I come back over. We stand over there and talking. And she's like crying. <laughs> she did not want to go. But she was willing to concentrate and dedicate to what I believe the will of God was for our life. And what God was telling us to do. I mean, it was you know, when you read about Mexico City at that time, it's not a thrilling thing. You know, the smog, it's a, it's a dormant volcano. 
sitting in the top of a dormant volcano. 20 million people were expected by the year 2000. I don't think it got that big, but still. I mean, you know, uh, lung diseases and all this kind of stuff because of, you know, raising your babies there and all this. You just, there was nothing appealing to it in the natural. Not helping my hipless wife at this point. Okay? Oh, it made L.A. look like, you know, the Sebastian of, 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 of tropical islands. Yeah. And um, so, you know, we, we, we say yes. So I start trying to raise money and stuff. But then I really start praying about this. Lord, you know, help us make, you know, we get the money, da 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 And all of a sudden, he starts talking to me. See, when you consecrate and dedicate to God's will, he can steer your boat. So I'm sitting here, been through all this with my wife, been through all the battle to get her over here. God, you got to talk to her. I can't. You know what I'm saying? The man, don't ever tell me you hadn't done with that with your wife. All right? Because I know you have. You going to talk to her because she ain't listening to me. You can't go, go try to pull a woman submit and see how that works out for you. I want to talk to you at the church when you do. If you can see. Guys not swole together. Woman submit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But as I started moving more into this, yes, Lord, we're, we're, willing, we're doing your will. We're going, we're going to do what you want us to do. We're going to... I started getting this coming up into my spirit. I'm like, I start casting it down. I bind that in Jesus' name. Because I started hearing, I didn't want you to go. I just wanted you to be willing to go. I'm like, I had to deal with that five foot two inch Cherokee for. And now you coming back and telling me. What? You've got to be kidding me. You go deal with that. I'm like, you know. And so I, I'm, I'm, I, and I go through this for a few weeks, you know, because I'm like, you just don't hear something and run off with it. I've got to know. We've already said we're going. We're raising money to go. Getting commitments to monthly to, to pay for, help pay for going to London. Family was so generous that he gave us a penny. Not a dime. Family members didn't didn't ante up anything to help us. I guess if they're going to start a brew, brewery or something, they may have helped out, but they won't help us go to, go do Jesus Jesus work. You know, um, so, and finally I just, I, I, I said, told my wife, I said, we got to go talk to the pastor. She said, why? I said, I keep getting, he didn't want us to go, he just wanted us to be willing to go. And I'm sitting there with that kind of going around, but, you know, all this other stuff, the commitment, you know, uh, you got to go, we're going to go, okay. Yeah, she, she switches over and says, I'll go. She went, hey, she won't help about it. And I knew it. She got on board. And in here, God began to speak. And when he told me before, but we, we set up a meeting with the pastor, said, we got to, we got to talk. We've got to talk about Mexico. I've got to talk. And um, went over to the house, sat down with him. He said, look, I need some direction here. I've been praying, and I keep getting some things about Mexico. And I said, I need your input. What do you think? He said, what are you getting? <clears throat> what do you think? What are you getting? Well, see, see, and the wisdom, even in his youth, he had, he had great wisdom. Um, if you tell people the answer, and something goes awry later on, even if it was the right answer, they'll blame you. If they get the answer, and you go, yeah, that's right, then they know that when it goes awry, they can't blame you, okay? <clears throat> Things just went awry, okay? I said, well, I'll be honest with you, I keep getting we're not supposed to go. And he didn't flinch. He said, don't go then. He said, my wife's been screaming in my ears for six weeks that y'all ain't supposed to go. 
And see, they couldn't say anything. Because then I'd be led by them and not the Holy Ghost. See, that's great wisdom on their part. Amen. Great wisdom. And, um, you know, and I'm glad they had that because it was like a burden rolled off of me at that moment that we weren't, we weren't supposed to go. And the Lord told me, I could not have used you here if you weren't willing to go there. He said, as clear as anything else. Because unless I'm willing to do anything he asks, I can't just do what I want to do. What's, what's pleasing to me. Okay? We can market our ministries. We can, we can make them look like we're the slickest thing, you know, in packaging and, you know, and everything. I mean, since peanut butter and sliced bread. I mean, kind of like that movie, The Preacher's Wife. That man's smile is so oily, uh, you could fry chicken on it. Or so greasy, you could fry chicken on it. Okay? You, you could have your ministry so marketed and not be here and not be doing what God does. I see too many people leave and go to Tulsa and start a church in Tulsa because they were on their own staff at the big church and they got a name and people fell in love with them and they got those people got disgruntled with the pastor and they and then they go out and start a church and they all run over there and talk about how great they are. Oh, give me a stinking break. You're operating under somebody else's anointing. You're operating under their covering. Let's see how great you do in, in Timbuktu. Why don't you go to the boonies somewhere and find out how great your ministry is? You know? No, you're there because it's you, you've got your built in crowd. Our church is going and blowing. Yeah, go go and blow somewhere where nobody's at. Let's see how you do. I want to see it. Yeah, where nobody's ever heard of you. You don't have that platform. Let's see how you do. Yeah. Then come talk to me. Go stick it out where it's dry. It's been tough. Hello? You don't have all the glitz and the glamour and the, and the fame and the adoration of people. But you obey God. Go, go, go obey God in the tough places. And then I want to hear about the good places after you obeyed Him in the tough places. You consecrated in the tough places, Amen. Okay, these are hard. These are hard. Now, I had no idea I was going to say any of that. So anyway, we didn't go to Mexico City. <laughs> and less than a year later, I was on staff at the church, and about a, year, a little over a year later after that, I was here in Greensboro. And then my whole life changed because what God had for me, I never knew was going to happen. I knew. It's a funny thing. I knew the day I got born again, right after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I was going to the Orient to preach. I knew it. Didn't know, I didn't know that I was going to be spending any time. I, and I thought I was a missionary. You know, my first thought was, I'm going to be a missionary to the Orient. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'm on this journey, and I'm not seeing that happen. And we talked about, y'all mind? Talk about how you know Mark Bazzi started those Bible schools in Europe, and I was going there and doing those things. And then you know he was flying home one day and picked up a, a travel magazine on the plane, and it had said something about Southeast Asia. And the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, "The same thing you've done in Europe will work in, the, in Southeast Asia." He said, uh, "So he was starting Bible schools in, in Asia." And the moment he put that in his newsletter, and I read it, I went, "That's it. That's it." God told me years ago I was going to Orient to preach, and I knew I was going to preach. And there's there it is, right there. It's right there. It's right there. And I'll never forget because in 1979 is when I got born again. And in 1999, 20 years later, I stepped off the plane onto the tarmac in Bangkok, Thailand. And I had to, do it, had to fight back the tears. Because what God showed me days after I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm, st I'm standing there. In fulfillment of the Word of God. And the journey to get there, we don't have time to do it tonight. The journey to get there was so. He'll be, he'll be in Nazarene. He's going to come out of Egypt. He's going to come out of Bethlehem. You know, kind of thing. This twist and turn to the story to get there. 
But it happened. I said, it happened. Just like he said it would happen. And I couldn't take 1979 and 1999 and all the stuff happened in between and ever write that story. God had to write that story. But he had to write that story, and the only way he could write that story is if I stayed here in consecration and dedication to his will. He's writing your story as you're going. Now listen, he already knows what he wants it to be. He's writing it as you go. He already knows what it is. It's being written as you go. But you got to stay here to get there. If you want to get to the place called there, you're going to have to go through here. You're going to have to get consecrated and dedicated to the will of God. Amen? Praise God. We look, I about to cry three times. I'm trying to. <clears throat> Hallelujah. It's the greatness of our God. When I look back and I see, you know, I've been to Estonia. I've been to uh, Sweden. I've been to England. I've been to the Czech Republic. I've been to Czech, um, you know, Italy. I've been to Germany. I've been to France. I've been to Spain. I've, you know, I've been to uh, Thailand. I've been to the Dominican Republic. I've been to these places all around the world and preached the gospel of Jesus. Mexico City wasn't my place. But I've been a lot of other places. He had to know I'd be willing to go there, and he's used me all over. I want to say one more thing. I want your, your, your prayer and your assistance. There are things I know we're, we're not a huge church yet. But I have to obey God. There's things I need to do worldwide. And we need to get there as a congregation for me to be able to go. The nation of Estonia, I am, I am, um, I, don't want to use, I don't want to use a word that would sound arrogant, but I'm held in high esteem. Because I, I came in there right after the Iron Curtain fell and I gave my heart to them and fell in love with them. They, they know I love them. And they'll send word when, they, when Ken Cassock's coming to America and I get to see Ken or talk to Ken. They've sent word. Tell Pastor Ed we said hi. You know, there's places to go. There's things to do. We have, we've had an open door to living water teaching in Guatemala for decades, and we just haven't been able to go. God wants to do things. And this church is part of it. Listen, if I go and you're, you're sending, you're part of it. Amen? There's still things for me to do. Working as a TA at a school, helping make tents right now for, you know, ministry purposes. I'm doing this week's day in ministry to keep the church going. I'm making tents. It's not my career. Okay? I've become a bivocational pastor for a season. It's not my life. It's not my goal. This is not what I want to do forever. I really don't want to be F-bombed three times a day every day. Or threatened or anything else. You know? I do want to make a difference in people's lives, which I am, am doing. Okay? Praise the Lord. Love you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Remember this, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See you again next time. And until then, you be blessed in Jesus' name.